Hello and welcome. I am Professor Raman and this is module 20 of this course International Criminal Justice. Module 20 is called Modes of Criminal Liability Part 1. In this module the learning outcomes are spread across the next three modules. In these three modules you will first learn about the different kinds and classifications of criminal liability both individual as well as several or joint as established in the jurisprudence and case law uh, of the ICC, ICTY and the ICTR. Secondly, you will learn about the meaning of and the elements necessary to establish modes of liability such as joint criminal ent enterprise, co-perpetration of crimes and indirect perpetration of crimes. You will also study some select cases from several international courts and tribunals where individuals have been held liable for such acts. Let us begin now with modes of liability part 1 which talks about responsibility. Responsibility in international criminal law arises both when a person materially commits a crime and when she engages in other modes of criminal conduct including omission. This first module provides an overview of the modes of liability as developed by the ICTY, the ICTR and the International Criminal Court. Various modes of liability that are recognized under customary international law have been incorporated into the text of the statutes and treaties that form the basis of the ICC, ICTY and the ICTR. It is worth noting the Rome Statute, while establishing modes of liability, set up standards independent of those already present in the ICTY and ICTR. The International Criminal Court does not recognize joint criminal enterprise per se. Rather, the Rome Statute has incorporated a different form of common purpose liability that it chooses to call co-perpetration under Article 25 Clause 3a, an indirect co-perpetration and other forms of common purpose liability which are listed in Article 25 Clause 3 Subclause D. International criminal law appears to have come a very long way since the Nuremberg and Tokyo trials after the Second World War to the modern ad hoc tribunals for Yugoslavia and Rwanda. These decades of jurisprudence have led to the creation of a well-polished system of doctrines and principles that comprise the body of international criminal law. One facet of this development is the modes of perpetration of such international crimes and consequently how individuals may be made liable for committing these acts. The International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia has famously stated in one of its most celebrated decisions that two separate categories of liability for criminal participation appear to have crystallized in international law. One, co-perpetrators who participate in a joint criminal enterprise on the one hand and aiders and abettors to joint criminal enterprise on the other. It is important to know that the consequences suffered and the penalties incurred by individuals convicted of the various categories or modes of liability are the same under various treaties and case law. There is no legal distinction as to this distinguishment that the ICTY recognized and this arises mainly because there is the lack of an agreed scale of penalties in international criminal law and the preparatory or rudimentary nature of the involvement of this field of law and the resultant lack of formalism doesn't permit for this. Thus the classes or modes of liability set out different kinds of participation in crimes based on the intrinsic features of each mode. These classes are purely descriptive and judges independently decide the degree of culpability of each accused person in a given case. This in turn decides the severity of punishment to be meted out to the individual. Let us begin with the most interesting feature that is joint criminal enterprise as a mode of liability. 
joint criminal enterprise a basic characteristic of international criminal acts as opposed to independent crimes under municipal law is that the perpetrators involve function in large numbers and cooperate at different levels and in different capacities in order to achieve one act in this context to dilute the liability of a perpetrator working at the fringe of a broader criminal venture would be anything but morally to solve this issue the principle of joint criminal enterprise holds individuals criminally liable for participation in crimes committed by larger groups of people by following the doctrine of common purpose liability thus individuals can be made liable if they embark upon a criminal activity which is actually carried out by other persons who share with them this common intention this is referred to as jce although this is one of the foundations of criminal liability and that that foundation is that no person should be made responsible for any act but their own the advantage of jce lies in the fact that it attributes responsibility to those who engage in criminal behavior through oppressive criminal structures in which different perpetrators act in different ways and at different times to accomplish one criminal act on a massive scale the concept of joint criminal enterprise emerged around the time of the first world war but in 1999 as a part of the tadic appeal the decision of the international criminal tribunal of yugoslavia that we have spoken about before joint criminal enterprise was brought up again as a mode of personal criminal liability article 7 clause 1 of the statute of the icty stipulates that a person who planned instigated ordered committed or otherwise aided and abetted in the planning perpetration preparation or execution of a crime referred to in articles 2 through 5 of the icty by statute shall be individually responsible for that crime by using this provision of the statute the main object and purpose of the tribunal together the icty by ruled that it has jurisdiction over all natural persons relevant to the commission of a crime that is not only those who materially undertook the act in question but also those who undertook portions of the act at different times thus although committed under the above definition uh, it would ordinarily imply that the actual physical act of committing a crime is what is being punished joint criminal enterprise has been read into the statute for it to include involvement under the scope of this definition three kinds of joint cl- criminal enterprise have been accepted as part of the body of customary international law the first is the most basic form the principle where all co-perpetrators have the same form of criminal intention and act upon it together for example when an entire group functions with the intent to kill it doesn't matter criminally speaking who performed the pristine act of murder as long as all those who were involved intended to do so and helped the process in some way the second form of jce is a systemic form this refers to the existence of a systemic form of criminal ill treatment where a given accused is aware of and actively participates in perpetrating an offense the third form is the extended form this arises when multiple people have agreed on a joint criminal enterprise and a member of that joint criminal enterprise commits a crime that although outside of the common purpose is a natural and foreseeable consequence of carrying out the common purpose ever since the tadic appeal of the international criminal tribunal for yugoslavia courts such as the extraordinary chambers in the courts of cambodia the international criminal tribunal for rwanda and the special court for sierra leone have relied upon this doctrine following several years of now well established jurisprudence 
It is now accepted as a well-defined concept that JCE exists in international criminal law. The implications of this doctrine have been the topic of heated debate among scholars of international law. Some argue that joint criminal enterprise is a positive development because it allows the prosecution of criminals who might otherwise have escaped strict liability by exploiting the technical loopholes in the law. There are others of course who do not agree and they argue that in fact joint criminal enterprise is a contravention of the principle of culpability clearly established under criminal law. In reality, the wider that the net the prosecution casts, the more the chance of bringing the perpetrators to justice. The second kind of liability I would like to discuss with you is perpetration. Criminal liability is attached only to the person or persons who either singularly or jointly carry out the physical act of committing a crime. Such people may be referred to as perpetrators of the crime. Perpetration is thus the actual or the physical act of carrying out or committing a prohibited conduct while having the required mens rea or criminal intention. In some cases courts have minimized or mitigated the guilt of individuals executing illegal orders by citing a lack of mens rea. For example, in the Alphonse Gottfried case, which speaks about ill treatment at the Majdanek camp, the court held that according to established case law, quote, the offender or accomplice is defined as one whose thoughts and actions coincide with those of the author of the crime, who willingly gives in to incitement to political murder, silences his own conscience and makes another person's criminal aims the basis of his own conviction and his own action." Close quotes. Accordingly, the accused could only be shown to have an attitude of guilt if over and above the activity that she was instructed to carry out, she had performed some contributory act on her own initiative beyond the call of duty as it were and had acted with particular ruthlessness in the extermination operation or had shown a personal interest in the killings. The Gottsfried case concluded that people at the end of a chain of command who have no individual power to take decisions or to act or desist from acting are not guilty. To be convicted, the accused has to be personally motivated and show an interest in carrying out the act that they were ordered to carry out. Let us now talk about two important kinds of perpetration because international criminal law has historically made this distinction. First, co-perpetration. If multiple people commit the same crime, where all of them are substantively involved in the perpetration of the crime, and also perform the same act while doing so. This is referred to as co-perpetration. The criminal conduct and mens rea in this case are common to all participants. Then we talk about indirect perpetration under which there are two subcategories. One aiding and abetting. A person who does not share the criminal intent of the principal perpetrator but aids or assists her in the commission of the crime is still said to have participated in it in the capacity of an aider or a better. In establishing whether an individual has aided or abetted a crime, it is important to follow certain objective elements such as was there practical assistance from the allegedly aiding individual or was there encouragement or moral support by the accused individual to the principal perpetrator of the crime. Where such assistance or support has a substantive effect on the perpetration of the crime, it ought to be considered. A subjective element is also important in establishing these objective criteria. It is not necessary for an aider or an abetter to have the same common plan or purpose as the principal perpetrator or even for the aider or abetter 
to share the criminal intention of the principal perpetrator. It is only required that such person consciously assist or support the perpetrator while knowing that her action will assist in the perpetration of a crime or intending to assist the crime. This subjective element will be discussed in more detail later and more in the notes that are given with this module. In the ICC statute, Article 25.3c talks about aiding and abetting a criminal. An individual will be liable if, for the purpose of facilitating the commission of such a crime, that is a crime within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, she or he aids, abets or otherwise assists in its commission or in its attempted commission including providing the means for the commission. With respect to the assistance provided by the aider, this may take the form of positive action or an active and conscious omission made by her before, during or after the perpetration of the crime by the principal perpetrator. The assistance could be tangible or moral or physiological. For example, in the case of Schoenfeld and others, the Advocate General mooted that if the accessory, that is the aider or a better, watched for his companions to prevent a surprise or remained at a convenient distance in order to assist in their escape if necessary, or was in such a situation as to be able to readily come to their assistance, the knowledge of which was calculated to give additional confidence to her companions, she was in contemplation of law present, aiding and abetting, even if not actually physically present. However, the simple presence of an individual at the scene or the place where a crime is being commissioned or committed or in fact being not by omission being committed will not always amount to aiding or abetting. Only when the accused individual substantively encourages the crime by virtue of her authority as an onlooker does it count as aiding or abetting. Further, the encouragement must be such that it should lead to the perpetrator receiving a greater amount of moral and psychological support. This topic was discussed in the 1948 synagogue case. That case was decided in accordance with the Control Council Law No. 10 that the German Supreme Court applied in British occupied zone. The accused in that case was convicted for a crime against humanity without having actually taken part in the planning or ordering of that crime. He was, however, a senior militant of the Nazi party. He was regularly present at the crime scene. He had an expert knowledge on the topic of criminal enterprise. In another case, the pig cart parade case, as it is called, an individual was not convicted for mere presence at the crime scene during the commission of the crime. This case was decided in the same court. Now the accused was simply a spectator who attended a Nazi troop parade in civilian dress. This was in the pig cart parade. Two political opponents of the Nazi were openly humiliated during the parade and the accused followed the parade the entire time without taking any active part in it. However, in 1948, the court held that the defendant's conduct could not, even with certainty, be evaluated as objective or subjective approval. Furthermore, silent approval that does not contribute to causing the offence in no way meets the requirements for criminal liability. In another case on the same topic, a much more recent case, the case of Furun Zija, the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia Appeals Chamber found that an accused can be convicted for aiding and abetting a crime when it is established that his conduct amounted to tacit approval and encouragement of the crime and that such conduct substantially contributed to the crime. This form of aiding and, ab and abetting is not criminal responsibility for omission. 
In the cases where this category was applied, the accused had a position of authority. He was physically present on the scene of the crime and his non-intervention was seen as tacit approval and encouragement for the perpetrators. Now, the subjective element which is required to be proved in order to establish the aiding abetting requirement of a crime consists of two important requirements. Firstly, that the associate or the accessory or the abettor or aider must know the nature of the criminal act that the principal has undertaken, is about to undertake or will be uh, or is undertaking with his help. Even if the aider doesn't know the specific details of the crime involved, he or she need only to be aware of one of the two things. That is the criminal intention of the perpetrator or the risk that the perpetrator may engage in criminal conduct. This was clearly explained in the case of Brima and another, where the special tribunal for Sierra Leone in trial chamber found that the mens rea required for aiding and abetting is that the accused knew that this act would assist the commission of the crime by the perpetrator or that he was aware of the substantial likelihood that his acts may assist the commission of a crime by the perpetrator. Secondly, the intent to willingly help or encourage the principal perpetrator while committing the crime must be present in the subjective evaluation of the aider or a better. In the case of Akayasu, which we have dealt with uh, previously, the ICTR discussed uh, this and said that Akayasu, who in his capacity as mayor was responsible for maintaining law and order in the commune of Taba, had the effective authority over the communal police. The inhabitants of Taba respected Akayasu. They followed his orders. Akayasu himself admitted before the chamber that he had the power to assemble the population of the commune of Taba and that they obeyed his instructions to assemble. It had also been known to the chamber that a very large number of Tutsi were in Taba between 7th April and the end of June 1994. Knowing of the killings, he opposed them and attempted to prevent them only until 19th April 1994 after which he not only stopped trying to maintain law and order in his commune, but was also present during the acts of violence and killings and sometimes even gave orders himself for bodily or mental harm to be caused to certain Tutsi. He endorsed and even ordered the killing of several Tutsi. The trial chamber held that the fact that Akayasu as a local authority, firstly failed to oppose the killings and to condone serious bodily or mental harm constituted a form of tacit encouragement which was compounded by him being present during several such criminal acts. The trial chamber used certain other facts to support its decision. They found that Akayasu was present during a number of crimes, most significantly crimes involving sexual violence against Tutsi women. He tacitly encouraged such horrid acts through his attitude and utterances. Thus the court concluded that Akayasu was criminally responsible for having abetted in the preparation or execution of the killings of members of the Tutsi group and the infliction of serious bodily and mental harm on some other members of these groups. Finally, the case of Sfurunzija, which we have spoken about several times before, before the ICTY trial chamber, has also had occasion to hold that since an officer of the Bosnian Croat Armed Forces was present during a victim's rape and had subsequently interrogated her, he was liable for having assisted and encouraged the crime committed by another officer, even though he did not commit the crime himself. We now speak about the second kind of involvement, that is incitement. When an individual instigates, 
induces or persuades another to commit a crime, it is called incitement. The individual accused of incitement must have the intent to commit the crime and must take steps or measures to prompt someone else to commit it. Incitement can be concluded by evidence from both positive acts as well as from evidence of omission. It has certain objective elements such as direct and explicit incitement followed by the commission of a crime. The only exception to the requirement of the second element that is the actual commission of the crime is in the cases of genocide. Apart from these, the final criminal act and the instigation must bear a direct relationship with each other. The subjective elements required for incitement are that the person directly intended to provoke the commission of a crime or the probability of the crime being committed as a result of the incitement was known to the accused and that the requisite mens rea was present in the accused. In the case of Kurt Meyer, where the accused was tried by a Canadian military court sitting at Aurich in Germany, the judge advocate in that case stated that, quote, as it is an offence to deny quarter to prisoners, I think an officer may be convicted of a war crime if he incites and counsels troops under his command to deny quarter whether or not prisoners were killed as a result thereof. It would seem to be common sense to say that not only those members of the enemy who unlawfully kill prisoners may be charged as war criminals, but also any superior military commander who incites and counsels his troops to commit such offences. Close quotes. Thank you.